Ecofictologists, my name is Lovis and today I want to talk about what I think ecofiction can bring to the conversation on science communication. Last week I posted a video on my top five reasons why I think scientists and the public are not really on good speaking terms and I'll put a little link to that at the top of the screen and I promised that I would discuss how I think ecofiction can address each of these five shortcomings. I'm a woman of my word so here we are and let's get into it. Number one, detail. Level of detail is, I think, proportionate to the amount of time that you're trying to squeeze it into. You could put the same amount of detail into a longer presentation, and if you intersperse it with some easy to understand and absorb information, then the detail feels less excessive. One of the issues for anybody giving public presentations is that you're generally limited by time, not to mention attention span. But the medium of books gives you room to breathe. People can take the journey at whatever pace they like. They can go back and reread if they missed something. It's hard to go back in a presentation. And if you miss something, then you're playing catch up for the rest of the time, which is very stressful. You can also intersperse the scientific information with parallel storylines. Most books will have parallel storylines anyway to keep up the excitement. And in that way, you can kind of buy yourself time and attention for a sneaky bit of science every now and then. In PC6, Trails in the Sand, for example, we follow an environmental journalist as she documents the conservation efforts for the sea turtle after the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. But we also follow her as she discovers family history, family dynamics, friendships, and romance, as well as touching on some mental health issues. Giving variety between all the detail gives the reader a bit of a break and then they're ready for the next time that you want them to absorb a little bit of information. This is really hard to do in a presentation or an article because you're limited by length or time, um, but it's very achievable in the format of ecofiction. Number two, jargon. I'm going to go back to time here a little bit. Uh, when we're presenting, we often don't have time to define every single term that the audience might not be familiar with. Um, and even if we did, there would be some who would find that very patronizing. <laughs> Ecofiction combats this by shifting focus from the reader to another character in the narrative. There's a writing technique called having a Watson character. Uh, if you're familiar with the tales of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, um, the only way that the reader is able to follow the logic and thought process of Sherlock Holmes is because he has to continually explain it to Dr. Watson. And in explaining it to him, he also explains it to us, the reader. This kind of technique is used across genres when there's a lot of background information that you want the reader to have, but you don't want to make them read through an info dump, which can be very boring. For example, with sci-fi or fantasy world building, when you have a history and a language and jargon. A newcomer on board a spaceship is the perfect person to explain all the protocols and all the technical gibberish to, and then the reader has all the information they need in nice intelligible ways without having to figure it all out for themselves. This is why portal fantasies work, because the main character is experiencing everything for the first time and therefore shares the reader's confusion and eventually learning. This can be and has been used in eco-fiction in the same way, Barbara Kingsolver's sci-fi novel Flight Behavior gives a lot of scientific detail, but because the character we are following is not a scientist, she asks all the questions that the reader has and the scientists in the story explain everything to her. It's a funny thing that happens, this difference between reading an info dump, which is just explanation given in paragraph form, um, compared to an explanation given in conversation, which is far more fun to read and therefore sticks better in the reader's memory. They can file it away as saying, okay, this is important, I better remember this. Aside from the explanations of individual terms, the language and sentence structure in a novel is very different from that in a scientific paper or presentation. Literary prose is much easier to read. This is why people can completely lose themselves in a book. I don't think I've met anybody who says that they can completely lose themselves in a scientific paper. Escapism is not the word I think of to describe that kind of reading. Number three, access. 
there are two ways to interpret the word access. One, the ease of getting to something, and two, the ease of something getting to you. And I will explain why I think those are different in a minute. First, the ease of you getting to something. Last week I identified one of the issues in science communication being that only a small proportion of scientific journals are open access. So even if the public wanted to read it, most journals they would need to pay a yearly subscription of round about the £100 mark. Now I know that people need to buy books as well. And I know that many people can spend way more than £100 on books in a year. So it might seem like the access is very similar seen in a financial light. So this is where I am going to sing the praises of public libraries. I highly recommend that you look up your local library and see which books they have available for you. Many, many ecofiction novels are uh, award-winning, best-selling books that libraries are more likely to have on hand because they are so popular, even if you weren't even looking for ecofiction. I think you could get a long way into your ecofiction education without spending anything, just by going to the library. My ecofiction to be read list is over 100 titles long and always growing, um, but I can find about a quarter of them at my local library. And a quarter might not sound like a lot, but that's at least 25 books. 25 books will get most people through a year. That's two books a month. And most libraries take requests, so if you're desperate for a particular title, let your library know. And if other people have expressed the same interest, then they might be able to help you out and get that title in stock. And pro tip, if your library doesn't have it, look at your local charity shops. Often they will have book sections, and most of what's on my ecofiction bookshelf is from a charity shop. If buying lots of new books is not in your budget, that's fine. There are options available to you to get access to ecofiction books. Secondly, the ease of something getting to you. Ecofiction is sneakier than a scientific journal. It's like a science communication ninja. A very small proportion of the public will seek out a scientific journal, and maybe a small proportion of the public will seek out ecofiction books. But many people are looking for mysteries, thrillers, sci-fi, fantasy books. And ecofiction can put a lot of different storylines into these genres. Storylines about climate change and anthropogenic impact with parallel narratives that people can connect to. So the reader is often reading an ecofiction book without having had to go through any extra effort to find it. They've just stumbled across it. Even if they don't take it on board, they've at least been exposed to it, they've experienced it in a language that they can understand and connect with, and maybe sometime down the line they'll think back to that book and say, oh, I remember how that played out. Can we not? Number four, relatability. Last week I mentioned that the public often doesn't feel personally affected by the science that is being presented if the scientist has not taken the audience's um, experiences and concerns into account. But this is the beauty of fiction. We allow ourselves as readers to be taken on a journey in somebody else's shoes. There's just enough distance to maybe allow our minds to be a little bit more open than they maybe would be if we were just having a conversation about science. And we gather experiences without actually having to go through them. Many people don't live in those places where they can see climate change and habitat destruction happening on their doorstep, and it's so much harder to make people care about things that don't directly affect them. But characters in novels are designed to be relatable. They are carefully crafted so the readers can connect with them. Because while a good portion of books are plot-driven and they do have an audience, probably the majority of books are character-driven because you care more about the plot when you care about the characters. Having an emotional connection makes everything more intense and you want to understand. Even just putting scientific information about events happening somewhere else in the world into a human context, into a character that the reader can connect with, makes it so much more relatable. There might be something in there that makes the reader go, oh, I've experienced that, or oh yeah, that's what I thought. And there you have it, the reader is more invested and ready to add the experiences of that character to their own toolbox. And number five, structure. This one is fairly obvious, and I'll just say again what I said last week, people like stories. The narrative form connects much better with people than a presentation or an academic paper. As a species, the way we communicate is through storytelling. Our entire entertainment industry is based on telling stories, TV series, movies, books, online games. And you cannot tell me that people don't get invested into these narratives. 
We get into characters, and then we care about what they care about. The structure of an eco-fiction novel, I think, ties the other four points together really nicely. Uh, the longer structure of a novel means you have more time for explanation and detail. The timing and attention that a novel is given is reader-defined, which means that the reader is far more in control of their own understanding than during a presentation. The fact that novels have characters who can share in the reader's learning experience takes the pressure off of the reader to ask the right questions and maybe even research the answers. And ecofiction lets you hide little scientific goodies in and amongst other storylines so you might reach people you never would have otherwise. The main reason, however, is that it's fun. Reading is fun. And getting people to take on board messages about climate change and anthropogenic impacts, not always fun. Getting them to change their behavior, often very difficult. If you can engage with them with very little effort cost to them, that's a massive win. So there it is, ecofictologists. Those are my five ways in which I think ecofiction can help bridge the gap between scientists and the public. And there are many more reasons, I'm sure, and I'd love to hear some of them from you. So if you've got any, pop them down in the comments below and let's have a chat about it. If you have any suggestions for topics you would like me to cover um, or questions for me, please feel free to leave those down there as well. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel and hit that bell so you get notified every time I upload a new video. So that's it from me. I'll see you all next week, ecofictologists. Go read something.